Good day. Welcome to another episode of the Audible Local Ledger Reads to the Blind podcast. You can get more information at audiblelocalledger.org. Stay tuned for today's reading. Hi, I'm Libby, and I'll be reading you today's Cape Cod Times, dated Friday, April 5th, 2024. In today's weather outlook, we have a real mixed bag. Highs will get up to the mid-40s today. It will be mostly cloudy and breezy with an occasional shower. Overnight, temperatures go back down into the 30s and we'll have showers in spots. Saturday is cloudy with showers. Sunday, we may even have flurries in the morning. Otherwise, it will be cloudy and highs will only get up into the 40s. By special request from a few of our faithful listeners, we now present the lottery numbers. For Thursday's midday drawing of the numbers game, we have numbers 2, 7, 0, and 8. For the evening drawing that day, we have numbers 5, 4, 4, and 4. Mass cash drawing yesterday was 10, 11, 19, 31, and 34. For Wednesday's Powerball drawing, We have numbers 11, 38, 41, 62, 65, and the extra ball of 15. And finally, for Tuesday's Mega Millions drawing, we have numbers 10, 50, 56, 60, 66, and the extra ball of number 19. Today's front page is covered with news about whales. We begin with this article, Studying Right Whales in Cape Cod Bay, Skim Feeding and Vertical Toes, by Marilee Cassidy of the Cape Cod Times. Dateline, Cape Cod Bay. All eyes were on the water. From inside the cabin of the research vessel Shearwater, Christy Hudak, a research associate with the Center for Coastal Studies in Provincetown, picked up a pair of binoculars and scanned Cape Cod Bay. Interns Morgan Perosi and Shreya Vinod were doing the same from the higher vantage point atop the cabin. The center's right whale ecology team was looking for North Atlantic right whales during a trip on Monday. In January, they had spotted the first of the rare cetaceans for the year in the bay. The team's goal is to document what the whales are eating and which individual whales are present. But even what they aren't eating may be important. We're going to be looking at the plankton and finding out what the right whales are feeding on and what they're not feeding on, Hudak said. The large whales return from their southern winter habitat to feed on tiny prey, Calanus, pseudocalanus, and centropages, crustaceans known as copepods, a species of zooplankton. Plankton nets are deployed to collect samples. Some are dragged behind the boat, following the path of a whale that was skim feeding. A vertical toe is lowered into the water to determine how deep in the water column the food source is. Early morning departure. The research vessel had left McMillan Pier in Provincetown earlier in the morning, making its way out of the harbor and around Long Point Light. After finding no whales around the Cape's sandy tip, the Shearwater cut across the bay to locations where there had been sightings reported earlier. After more than an hour, the crew spotted their first right whale of the day, one of about 19 that were documented during the nearly nine-hour trip. Researchers document the number of whales, their behavior, and if they're feeding, Perozzi said. Salinity and water temperature is recorded and photos are taken of the whales. I use my photo documentation not only to identify the whales, but for our health assessment, Perozzi said. We photograph the whole body, any new scars they may have, whether they look skinny or healthy. The whales may have identifying marks and features, whether it's a scar on its body or the unique pattern of callosities on their head. How to find a right whale. Locating the whales can be as simple as seeing them swim by with their mouths open, filter feeding zooplankton just below the water's surface before they slip back under the water, sometimes showing off flukes or tail as they dive deeper. They could be located by the sound or the sight of them exhaling through their blowholes. 
Another sign of whales are the footprints left behind by the movement of their flukes that create a circular pattern in the water as they move. Scientists estimate there are about 356 of these critically endangered whales. By identifying the whales, researchers can track them through their lives. During the 2022 to 23 season, 198 individual right whales were identified in and around Cape Cod Bay by the Provincetown Base team. This season, the team has observed 123 individual right whales in the bay, according to a statement from the center. For the first time this season, aerial observers from the center on Monday saw a right whale with her calf north of Marshfield. They were identified as 36-year-old Legato and her daughter, Staccato. The calf was born in December, and the two whales were first sighted together New Year's Eve by Florida's Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. We were just finishing a survey track line when we saw a right whale feeding less than a mile from the beach off North Marshfield. Center aerial observer and right whale researcher Ryan Schossberg said in the statement, we flew over to document the animal and all cheered in excitement when a little calf popped up by its side. It's always a relief to see right whale mothers arriving safely in Cape Cod Bay with their calves. The right whale team will continue to monitor by boat and plane the migration of the right whales. Most of the sightings happen in March and April. At times, the whales can be seen from shore, particularly on Provincetown's beaches. A second whale story on page one is headlined, Whale Calf Unlikely to Survive After Mom Found Dead, by Heather McCarran of the Cape Cod Times. In yet another setback for North Atlantic right whales, a female that recently gave birth was found dead about 50 miles off the coast of Virginia over the weekend. According to NOAA's fisheries, the fourth confirmed death of a right whale along the East Coast this year. The tally doesn't take into account three newborn calves that have not been seen with their mothers, including the newly dead whale's baby. Researchers in Massachusetts, which annually sees one of the highest densities of right whales in Cape Cod Bay of anywhere along the East Coast, as the animals migrate north for the summer, are discouraged by the latest loss. The situation so far in 2024 for right whales highlights the fact that much more needs to be done to prevent the extinction of this species. Said Amy Knowlton, a senior scientist with the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life at the New England Aquarium. It's frustrating that solutions that could address these threats are not being implemented more immediately. Knowlton was among the team who helped identify the newly deceased whale listed as number 1950 in the North Atlantic right whale catalog that's maintained by aquarium researchers. The whale was at least 35 years old and had only recently given birth to her sixth known calf. The pair, both in good health, was last seen on February 16th off Amelia Island in northern Florida, according to the aquarium. The calf has not been seen since the mother was found, and aquarium research say the baby, if alive, is not expected to survive without its mother. Right whale calves typically nurse for about a year. Where was the whale carcass found? NOAA Fisheries on Tuesday reported that the mother whale's carcass was found on March 30th by a team from HDR Inc. that was undertaking mid-Atlantic whale surveys for the U.S. Navy. The shark scavenged remains were found in the ocean east of Virginia's Back Bay National Wildlife Refuge and were towed ashore for a necropsy to determine the cause of death. The leading causes of death for right whales are vessel strikes and entanglement in traditional fishing gear. This latest death follows three others since the start of the year. What other deaths have occurred? On March 3rd, Two months after fishermen spotted it offshore from Adisto, South Carolina, with its head, mouth, and lips cut open by a boat propeller, a calf was reported dead on Cumberland Island National Seashore in Georgia, according to NOAA. The baby was the firstborn of the current calving season, initially spotted with its mother, Juno, listed as number 1612 in the North Atlantic right whale catalog, on November 28th. 
It was Juno's eighth known calf since 1986. A female yearling was found dead offshore of Savannah, Georgia, on February 13th. The first known offspring of Pilgrim, number 4340, a local favorite thought to have been born in 2013 in the warm waters of Cape Cod Bay near the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station. A three-year-old female, number 5120, washed up dead on Martha's Vineyard on January 28th. That individual suffered a chronic entanglement with traditional fishing rope, consistent with rope used in Maine state waters for trap and pot buoy lines, according to NOAA Fisheries. The agency said the latest death is the 40th in the ongoing unusual mortality event impacting North Atlantic right whales, which began tallying deaths and injuries in 2017. Since then, the effort has counted 34 seriously injured and 51 otherwise sick or injured whales. Survival of this species depends on no more than one whale death per year, according to NOAA Fisheries. For the critically endangered species, every loss takes them closer to extinction. But female deaths are especially devastating because there are so few reproductively mature females left. The latest population study released last fall placed the number of remaining right whales at 356, plus or minus seven, though the recent deaths and disappearances put the number around 349. The Center for Coastal Studies retiring director of right whale ecology, Stormy Mayo, has said only about 70 of the remaining whales are females old enough to reproduce. Philip Hamilton, senior scientist with the aquarium's Anderson Cabot Center, said if a female can avoid the double threats of vessel strikes and entanglements, she may produce 10 or more calves during her lifetime. With the loss of catalog number 1950, her female lineage now rests with her three daughters, none of which have calved yet, he said. The population in recent years has also seen lower birth rates and births at longer intervals. Changing speed regulations. As part of an effort to protect right whales, NOAA is proposing modifications to existing vessel speed regulations, including expanding the size and timing of seasonal speed zones along the East Coast. The proposed changes also call for including most vessels between 35 and 65 feet in the restricted speed zones and calling for mandatory adherence to speed limits within so-called dynamic speed zones in areas where right whales are seen and likely to linger. The proposed changes now under interagency regulatory review include both an expansion in time and space of seasonal speed zones extending restrictions to include most vessels measuring 35 feet to 65 feet in length, and implementation of mandatory, instead of voluntary, speed restrictions and dynamic speed zones, which are established when and where right whales are observed and are likely to remain. Mass Pardon for Possession of Cannabis Gains Approval by Sam Doran of the Statehouse News Service. The governor's council unanimously approved Governor Maura Healey's mass pardon Wednesday that grants official forgiveness to anyone convicted of simple cannabis possession in Massachusetts. The courts must still work to identify people to whom the pardon applies and update their records, which one counselor called an enormous task that could require a shot of funding from the legislature. At an informational hearing prior to the vote, Counselors spoke of the Massive Clemency Act as historic on a national scale, and two supporting witnesses, a state representative and a prosecutor, said it was about equity. Massachusetts changed state laws around marijuana possession, and this proposal is based on the simple premise of fairness and equity that a person should not bear the mark of conviction for an offense that is no longer a state crime. Suffolk County District Suffolk County District Attorney Kevin Hayden told the council, referring to the 2016 ballot initiative that legalized adult use cannabis. Representative Carlos Gonzalez, co-chair of the legislature's Public Safety Committee, 
said removing collateral consequences is an act of equity and justice, and that the mega pardon can uplift individuals, particularly those in Springfield and my communities, which have been burdened by past convictions. The hearing was partly intended to address some lingering questions, not all of which received a crystal clear answer. When Healy announced the pardon, March 13th, she described the action as applying to hundreds of thousands of people and said the approximate figure was extrapolated from data Lieutenant Governor Kimberly Driscoll again referred to hundreds of thousands of people at the council assembly. Counselor Terrence Kennedy of Linfield asked Hayden about the actual number of pardon recipients covered under the blanket action noting that he heard the number between 69,000 and 100,000 tossed around, and that trial court Chief Justice Heidi Breiger referred in a letter this week to approximately 22,000 adult cases contained in electronic records. Don't you think we should be making more of an effort to find those other people and who they are? Most people that have a marijuana conviction don't know what's going on in this room today and never will, Kennedy said. They're not going to get on a portal and fill out a form to get a pardon document. They're not going to be writing on a job application that they've been pardoned because they're never going to know it unless we reach out somehow. Don't you think we should be doing more? We should be doing as much as possible, I think, Hayden replied. And I don't mean to be glib, but thankfully that's a problem I don't have to worry about. That's for the governor and probation office to worry about. We expressed this concern at the time that the issue was raised. It should be as automatic as possible. Healy and Driscoll have been clear that no action is needed on the part of recipients to receive their pardon, though they may apply for an optional pardon certificate if they wish to. The exciting thing is no one is required to take any additional action, Driscoll said after the assembly. They are pardoned effective at the governor's council vote. In Breiger's letter, she told Healy's chief legal counsel, Paige Scott Reed, that for the past several weeks, we've been planning for the potential need to update court records and reported productive collaboration between the trial court, the state probation service, and the governor's office. The trial court chief justice also outlined her understanding of the process moving forward while telling Scott Reed that she respectfully declined to testify in person. Normally, a pardon recipient initiates the process for themselves by applying for clemency. In this extraordinary case, the government will attempt to identify who exactly was pardoned on Wednesday. The trial court will generate a list of cases that may be eligible for the governor's pardon, Breger wrote in the letter, which was read aloud by Driscoll at the outset of the hearing. She added that updates will be undertaken at a deliberate pace in the ordinary course upon request from the governor. The governor's office will use the list in two ways. One, to review individual cases and make eligibility determinations for pardons, and two, to verify information submitted to the governor's office by individuals requesting a pardon certificate. In both instances, the governor's office will provide to the trial court and Massachusetts Probation Service, on a reasonably paced and ongoing basis, the information pertaining to the individuals the governor's office has determined are eligible for a pardon. MPS and trial court clerks will update their records accordingly, Breiger wrote. Breiger said she believed the trial court and MPS can take the necessary next steps to effectuate the pardon on our respective records without undue burden. Kennedy struck a different tone about the newly created administrative burden. He told the news service that he thinks it's going to take some money to accomplish. I think the legislature is going to have to allocate some money for that, he said, describing the task laying ahead of the court clerk's offices as an enormous burden. And I've actually talked to some of them about that. They're very, very concerned about the workload. They have a pretty heavy workload now, and it's going to be a heavy burden on the clerk magistrate's office. They have to figure out who these people are. They have to make sure the records reflect the pardon. It's going to be an enormous task, Kennedy said. Some counselors underscored that a pardon alone does not remove the cannabis possession conviction from a person's criminal record. 
though would note on the record that it had been forgiven. Counselor Tara Jacobs said she recently learned the distinction between a pardon and expungement, a process which individuals would need to apply for that scrubs the record clean. As far as really trying to get it really off of people's records, Kennedy told Gonzalez it could be an area for future legislation. And I think you should take it back to the House and consider with your colleagues seeking some legislation, Kennedy said, adding that would take the umbrella forgiveness of marijuana possession convictions to the next step. Gonzalez told him he thought that's a discussion that's already on the table. In addition to Hayden and Gonzalez, the counselors also heard supportive testimony from advocate Daniel Vasquez, attorney Pauline Quirion, Newton Police Chief John Carmichael Jr., and Ron Iobucci of the Mass Hire South Shore Career Centers. Carmichael, who spoke at Healy's pardon press conference in March, where he announced the support of the Massachusetts Chiefs of Police Association, tempered that support Wednesday by saying it didn't come without controversy and was not a unanimous decision, but we still feel it's the right thing to do. Iobucci joined the hearing remotely from Carver, where he said he was with Healy on a workforce development matter. I want to underscore the importance of workforce development in what we're doing here, he said. I oversee the publicly funded workforce system in the South Shore, and I know the impact that this has on the lives of many people who come through our doors. We have job seekers, we have employers, and this criminal record is something that really makes a big difference. James Borgasani was in the hearing room Wednesday in his capacity as Chief of Communications for the Suffolk DA's office. But he was also an architect of the successful 2016 ballot initiative to legalize adult use cannabis. Initially bashful to speak personally, but given the green light to talk by the district attorney, Borgasani said the mega pardon is a major step and good for Massachusetts. I'm proud of Massachusetts voters of what they did in 2016, the former communications director for Yes on Four said. I think they led the way for states east of the Mississippi. We were the first ones that did it. And I think that I'm proud of Governor Healy for taking this step today because she's looking at what voters have done in Massachusetts and she's deciding that we have to retroactively make our laws reflect how voters say cannabis should be treated now. Healy said in a statement Wednesday afternoon that Massachusetts made history today, adding her thanks to the council and to President Joseph Biden for his leadership on this issue. Voters to Decide Accessory Dwelling Units Issue by Paul Gately, special to the Cape Cod Times. Dateline born. A measure on the May 6th town meeting warrant calls for cutting the red tape to set up an accessory dwelling unit, or ADU a change that could make it easier to find a good place to live in a converted garage, finished basement, or backyard cottage. In Article 25, approval of ADUs would be allowed by right and would no longer require a special permit from the Town Zoning Board of Appeals. The Building Commissioner Chief Zoning Officer would issue permits following in-house review relating to site and floor plans, elevations, and existing floor plan calculations. Bourne is one of three remaining Cape Towns that still issues special permits for detached or unattached ADUs through the appointed Zoning Board of Appeals. According to wording in Article 25, the purpose of the accessory dwelling bylaw is to broaden the range of housing choice by increasing the number of small dwelling units available in Bourne's housing supply. Planning Board Chair Dan Doucette on March 25th said ADUs could conceivably help contract crews working on a possible new Sagamore Bridge, for example, to secure local housing at a reasonable rate. Year-round ADU leases would be structured to preclude units becoming short-term rentals, he said. The idea of the bylaw request is to avoid special permit review by the appeals board, Doucette said. Easing ADU restrictions would also allow elderly owners to remain in their homes and increase the income flow of younger families seeking home ownership, he said. ADU rental agreements would be between tenants and homeowners, according to the planning board. 
ADUs must be designed to maximize the appearance of a single-family residential property, and ADUs must conform to all state and septic regulations according to the proposed bylaw. Town planner Jennifer Copeland told the Finance Committee March 11th that most property owners would likely convert garage space for ADUs and not create brand new dwellings that might disrupt neighborhoods. Square footage imperatives come into play, Copeland said, along with separate access requirements. She said she remains optimistic the bylaw revision is viable and will be favorably considered by voters, even those who might harbor concerns about increased demand for services and impacts on utilities and infrastructure. Veteran Finance Board members Amanda Bongiovanni and Rich Lavoie, however, are not convinced. They said the very description of affordable ADU units is misleading because market housing rental rates would be in effect, not necessarily below market rates. There are regulations accompanying the proposed change. Lawful primary dwellings must be owner-occupied with allowances for temporary absences. Fractional ownership is not allowed. Minimum lot size is 5,000 square feet. Less than that measure would require Board of Appeals review. The ADU and primary dwelling may not be rented for periods shorter than 90 days at a time and may not be used as daily or weekly rentals. There must be one parking space designated for each ADU bedroom. Also, the maximum ADU space would be 1,500 square feet and not more than two bedrooms. Select Board Chair Mary Jane Mastrangelo says such units are badly needed. They could supply small but desperately needed housing in an incremental way, she said. The units would also serve to help commuters to the Cape live here and not add to traffic tangles at the canal bridges, she said. A two-thirds vote is needed for the bylaw revision to prevail at town meeting. United Nations Body Sets Intersex Rights Resolution by Reuters, Dateline, Geneva. The United Nations Human Rights Council on Thursday voted to adopt a resolution designed to protect the rights of intersex people, the first initiative of its kind, which diplomats and rights groups described as a landmark moment for human rights. 24 countries voted in favor, 23 abstained, and none voted against the resolution, which was spearheaded by Finland, South Africa, Chile, and Australia. The UN has cited experts as saying that 1.7% of babies are born intersex, defined as having sex characteristics that do not fit binary notions of male or female. The resolution calls on states to combat discrimination violence, and harmful practices against persons with innate variations in sex characteristics and address their root causes, as well as help intersex people realize the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. It also requests that the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights publish a report examining in detail discriminatory laws and policies acts of violence and harmful practices against persons with innate variations in sex characteristics in all regions of the world. We've reached the halfway point of today's broadcast, and regular listeners are aware that at this stage of our broadcast, we move to the obituaries. Our first obituary is for John Joseph Gohegan, Jr., Dateline Sandwich. John Joseph Gohegan Jr., age 61, of Sandwich, passed away on March 29th after courageous battle with cancer. He was the cherished son of Barbara Flaherty Gohegan and the late John J. Gohegan. John spent his formative years in Walpole before settling in Cape Cod, where he established and operated All Cape Telecom. An excellent ice hockey player, John was renowned for his exceptional skating skills. As a friend of Bill W., he was a devoted member of Alcoholics Anonymous and found solace and support in his community. A passionate sports enthusiast, he found great joy in cheering for his beloved Bruins, Red Sox, and Patriots. For a decade, John resided in San Francisco, where he embarked on adventures following the Grateful Dead across the country. 
Known for his kind-hearted nature and unwavering compassion, John was a beacon of light to all who knew him. He never passed judgment and was regarded as a gentle soul by his family and friends. In addition to his mother, John is survived by his loving sister Mary, a sister and brother-in-law, and he will be deeply missed by his nephews and niece. A funeral mass will be celebrated at 11 a.m. Thursday, April 11th at Corpus Christi Church on Quaker Meeting House Road in East Sandwich, followed by burial at Sandwich Town Cemetery. Visitation will take place at the church prior to the funeral mass from 10 to 10.55 a.m. In lieu of flowers, please donate to the Sandwich Fire Department donation account. Notes of comfort may be left for the family at the website of Chapman Funeral. John D. O'Brien, Dateline Harwich. John Dennis O'Brien, whose civic and political engagement culminated with him helping revive the Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce to create new jobs and housing across the Cape, passed away April 2nd, surrounded by his loving family. He was the family's strong leader and taught his children and grandchildren their lives should focus on two touchstones, faith and family. John, age 90, was the sixth born of the eight children of Margaret Rita Mahoney and Arthur O'Brien of South Boston. Rita and Arthur moved their young family from Southie to Quincy, and John was born in the city's Wollaston section. John played football and basketball at Rockland High School. He worked odd jobs throughout his childhood, delivering newspapers, serving as a summer mailman, and driving a milk truck for White Brothers Dairy on Cape Cod. He graduated from Rockland High School in 1951. John met his future wife, Ann Nicholson Murphy, that fall when both began as freshmen at Brown University. John would proudly tell people he was an English major and that he loved to read and write during his entire life. He also was part of a football family. His father, Arthur, played for the Pear Marquette Knights at M Street Park in South Boston and his brother Paul played for an Ivy League rival, Harvard University. John himself played tackle for Brown from 1951 to 1954. He and Anne, who became great friends during their four years together in Providence, graduated in 1955. Anne worked briefly as a flight attendant for United Airlines, wanting to travel and live in New York City before the couple married in 1956. The O'Briens began their life together in the Chicago area, where John launched a career in sales and Anne worked at Northwestern University in Evanston. John became a success in the burgeoning semiconductor industry, today known as CHIPS, and began a long affiliation with ITT Semiconductor. In 1960, John and Anne had their first child, John D. O'Brien Jr. in Evanston. Shortly thereafter, John accepted a position with ITT that brought the family back to the Northeast. They settled in Situate and had their second son, Thomas N. O'Brien, in 1963. Their third son, William J. O'Brien, was born in 1969. In Situate, John served three terms on the Board of Selectmen, ultimately as its chairman. He was a leader in creating the first units of designated affordable housing in Situate in the early 1970s, which were created in partnership with the Archdiocese of Boston Planning Office. He and Anne gave their three sons a love of politics and government and taught them about their faith's call to actively and positively impact one's community. Until his final days, John would devour three newspapers daily and urge his children and grandchildren to make a positive impact on their community. In addition to his elective office, John served as a state delegate supporting former Governor Michael Dukakis and served on the Massachusetts State and Andover Town Democratic Committee at his urging. In 1975, John was transferred by ITT to Atlanta and the family moved to a new home in the city. In 1978, ITT transferred John back to Massachusetts, and the family settled in Andover. All three sons now live in Massachusetts themselves. 
John O'Brien Jr. went on to be elected to the Massachusetts Senate and today is chief operating officer of JERA, a Japanese energy company. Tom O'Brien is the CEO and managing partner of the HYM Investment Group LLC in Boston. Bill O'Brien was recently named the head football coach at Boston College. In 1992, John Sr. began a second career as executive director of the Cape Cod Economic Development Commission. He and Anne moved to Harwich, and John eventually oversaw the merger of the Cape Cod Economic Development Commission with the Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce. The new entity nearly doubled in membership and tripled in budget during his tenure. It also became a force for creating new jobs on Cape Cod through initiatives such as the Chamber's micro-lending program, which is credited with creating over 7,000 jobs on the Cape. Anne, meanwhile, built a career as an educator and librarian, working at Memorial Hall Library in Andover and serving as head librarian at the Pollard Memorial Library in Lowell. She also served as librarian at the Orleans Public Library. John was happiest when he and Anne were surrounded by their sons and their families, including their grandchildren. John was predeceased by another granddaughter, Marisol. John deeply loved each of his daughters-in-law and was part of a very large extended family of O'Brien and Murphy cousins who will all miss him dearly. In addition, John had a very large group of friends with whom he often played golf or enjoyed meals at Cumaquid Golf Club on Cape Cod. In recent years, John was primary caregiver for Anne. He was predeceased by his parents and six of his siblings. In addition to Anne, John is survived by his sister, Sheila. John will be remembered at a wake on Sunday, April 7th from 48 p.m. at the Chapman Funeral Home on Main Street in Harwich. A funeral mass will be offered at 11 a.m. on Monday, April 8th at Holy Trinity Catholic Church on Main Street in West Harwich. In lieu of flowers, donations may be made in John's name to the Family Pantry of Cape Cod in Harwich. Notes of comfort to the family can be posted at the website of Chapman Funeral. It's the first Friday of the month and time for Sara Lee Perils column. Columnist designs own farewell rather than to leave her legacy to others. Okay, so I've done my will and other documents for when I kick the bucket. What's left before I meet my maker? My legacy, which is essentially a letter about how I want to be remembered. Here's what I came up with. Dear readers of my column and other family and friends, if you are reading this, it means I've faked my own death so that I could have the final say to everyone I've ever held a grudge against. I've narrowed it down to the millions who had me disqualified from being on the 2024 presidential election ballot. I mean, you've got to vote for somebody. And to Tony, my high school boyfriend, who promised me my mother wouldn't catch us that night. I want future generations to remember all the staggering differences I've made. One, if it wasn't for me, there'd be no internet. I single-handedly invented it. Who else but me could make up a stupid word like Google? Two, I stopped counting after I won the Miss America title 12 times. My talent? Hypnotizing chickens. Three, I came up with the idea of the Nobel Prize. I win every year in the category of literature. The esteemed judges have said that my Cape Cod Times columns are not totally useless drivel. Four, I'm the one who told former Dunkin' Donuts CEO Robert Rosenberg to make regular donuts into little squished up balls and call them munchkins. Five, I told Burger King founder James W. McLemore, you can't just have one store in Jacksonville. Make it a chain for heaven's sake. Six, ever wonder who invented the peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Well, now you know. Seven, 18 seconds before the camera started filming Barbie, Margot Robbie grabbed me from my director's chair and begged me to take over her starring role. Sarah Lee, she said, I'm not beautiful enough. You are. Playing Barbie landed me the seven Oscars that Oppenheimer tried to swipe. Eight. 
I received the Olympic gold medal for winning in the category Rock, Paper, Scissors. 9. My charitable calling landed me on the cover of Time magazine as Philanthropist of the Year. You see, all I ever did was give, give, give. Enough, Sara Lee, my pleading public would say. You can't keep giving everything away. You need to have clothes on your back. You must save a few morsels of bread for yourself. Oh, no, I don't need clothing or food, I'd proclaim in my quiet, modest way. I've dedicated my life to helping the poor. Why else would I get my real estate license? And 10. At last week's annual convention of the prestigious New England Newspaper and Press Association, it was announced during the award banquet that I won first place humor columnist and first place serious columnist. This is actually true. Now I'd like to acknowledge those who made my life better and those who put it in the toilet. One, thank you to Dr. Meredith Gray, who as a sideline hustle to her job on Gray's Anatomy, is the chief of endocrinology at Mass General, where she discovered that I had Albert Einstein's genomes before he did, and therefore I should receive all the credit for his theory of relativity. Two, I thank my father for paying my tuition at Syracuse University, where I made the most out of his money by majoring in bagpiping. Three, my gratitude goes to the April 8th Eclipse fanatics, who only have a life for four minutes and 28 seconds of total darkness, yes, I looked it up, every 22 years, and who are only outdone, rather eclipsed, sorry, I had to, by those maniac extremist cicada devotees who crawl out of the dirt, I mean the cicadas, every 17 years. Four. Thanks to Norman Mailer, who'd have me over for cocktails at his Provincetown flat, where he'd beg me to finish his books and make the endings really good. And finally, for the person who inspired me the most. To my husband, Bob. One, thank you for your 34 years of vegetable gardening, which gave all the homeless rabbits in Marston's Mills an annual gathering place to decimate. This is true. Two. You impress the world by getting all the qualification questions right and therefore appearing as a contestant on the TV show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire when Regis Philbin was the host. This is true. Number three, you set the standard for excellence by winning 24 blue ribbons for your baked goods at the Barnstable County Fair. True. Four. I'm grateful I knew your mother, who smothered everything in ragu. You and I would play a guessing game. Is it chicken or fish? True. I lovingly recall what she said upon hearing I'm Jewish. I know one, my dentist. True. Number five, I do not thank you for loving our dogs more than you loved me. So true. Six. Thank you for helping me at Christmas when I got Santa to deliver an 18,000-pound boulder to our backyard. True. Seven, and for kayaking with me along every waterway on the Cape. In winter, we'd wear wetsuits, which made me look like the Michelin tire man with breasts. All true. Eight, and Bob, without your love and support, I'd have never walked again after my spinal cord injury. Very true. And so my funeral will be held at a BYOB barbecue and giant yard sale in the Vatican Sistine Chapel. Everything must go. Bargains galore. $45 raffle tickets will be sold, but only to poor people so that one of them can win the grand prize. A gift certificate to the day spa in Hyannis. When Oprah says my eulogy, she'll say, let us remember Sarah Lee, whose parting words were, Make sure you bury me with my cell phone and a wireless charger. Sarah Lee then lovingly yanked me back into her hospital room where she had demanded to be kept alive with machines until hell freezes over and shouted her final request. I want a mass cash ticket for next week's lottery in my stiff, dead hands. And so, now you know my legacy. Oh, but wait, I saved the best for last. Neil Armstrong can't get away with his big fat lie. Yours truly was the first to walk on the moon. 
and I'll be the first to be buried there. Award-winning columnist Sarah Lee Perrell lives in Marston's Mills, and her column runs the first Friday of every month. The headline on today's Ask Carolyn column reads, Husband expects wife to broker peace between him and sons. Dear Carolyn, I consider myself a good feminist, so I normally avoid talking in terms of gender roles, yet here I am. Is it the role of a wife and mother to help bridge a rift between a father and his grown sons? When I have an argument with one of my sons, leading us to not communicate for a time, she just goes merrily along as if it's none of her business. Sometimes the son needs to have explained how his actions hurt his dad, and sometimes dad needs to be told why those actions were important to the son. Sure, the guys should man up and talk it out, but men have egos, and you know in the real world, sometimes people retreat into stubborn silence and resentment. I'm not talking about mom or the wife talk, taking sides, but about being a conciliator. Frankly, this attitude that she's not involved in these two people's sadness or happiness is one reason we're separated, friendly, and slow walking to a divorce. Signed, Functional Single Parent. Dear Functional Single Parent, I consider myself a good masculist, yet here I am. Your men have egos has me rethinking my policy against falling off my chair in fits of snark. Yes, people of all varieties have egos. Yes, sometimes egos persuade people of all varieties to retreat into stubborn, silent resentment instead of regulating their emotions and using their words. When this happens, however, mature people recognize their mistakes, leash their egos, and initiate reconciliation themselves, modeling for children how it's done. They do not declare it incumbent upon the nearest mature female to goddess-splain them out of whatever messes they've egoed themselves into. Sometimes people need help, yes. We don't always get everything right, and it is healthy both to admit that and to model for kids, even grown ones, how to own our frailty. If you would like the opinion or assistance of nearby mature people of any variety, to help you fix your mistakes, then ask them for it. I suggest you refrain from asking this of your wife person, however, immediately after identifying her failure to read your mind as the attitude problem that's driving your union toward divorce. Hi, Carolyn. My husband and I are estranged from his sister. She's been emotionally abusive toward us, and the last straw was her bullying our 10-year-old son. I have her contacts blocked, but his sister keeps finding reasons to contact him. She texted saying she thought their mom was declining cognitively and to say her daughter missed my husband, so they needed to FaceTime. I think this is so manipulative of my sister-in-law, but my husband says he would be a monster for not responding. I don't want to insist my husband have no contact with his sister, but she is not a safe person for us, especially our son, whose needs, I think, should be paramount here. Signed, Anonymous. Dear Anonymous, they should, absolutely. The real question is whether your husband's boundaries are up to the challenge of his sister's manipulation. If you doubt that, then that's your discussion with your husband. Mermaids, Pickles, and a Big Bad Belgian Quad for National Beer Day by Frankie Rowley of the Cape Cod Times. In honor of National Beer Day, April 7th for those celebrating, we've rounded up some of the breweries on the Cape and included brews Cape Codders and tourists alike just have to try. Cape Cod and the islands have at least seven breweries. Try a pint or taste several at once with a flight in Falmouth, Martha's Vineyard, Dennis, Provincetown, Hyannis, and Mashpee. Looking to visit a couple of breweries at once? One way to be responsible is to choose a designated driver, but you could also book a brewery tour offered by Tap Tastings or City Brew Tours Cape Cod. Our slogan is, You Drink, We Guide, said Mark Reed, co-owner of City Brew Tours Cape Cod. Public tours don't officially start until May, 
but City Brew Tours Cape Cod, a franchised branch of City Brew Tours, a national company founded in Vermont, will run a Hyannis Taste of Cape Cod Tour and a Falmouth Taste of Cape Cod Tour. Prices were not available at press time. To book a private tour or to learn more about their upcoming public tours, visit their website, citybrewtours.com. Private tours take a minimum of 10 people to some of the Cape's breweries, wineries, and distilleries, which is up to the customer, but Reed does provide suggested stops. We're not like a drinking party bus, Reed said. We're bringing you to sample flights, so you're sampling different kinds of beer in much smaller quantity, but you're getting the experience of trying what each brewery has to offer. Mash pea-based tap tastings provides a shuttle service, picking up guests and taking them from brewery to brewery, winery and or distillery, and sometimes restaurants in their van, aptly named Barley. This is great for people who just want to get together and want nobody driving, Leslie Kaza, co-owner of Tap Tasting, said. They offer three levels of service, travel-only shuttle service, Barley Perks, and a prepaid inclusive service. For the starting level, guests pay $120 per hour for the tour with pickup and drop-off available within 20 miles of Tap Tastings Mashpee headquarters. For more information about Tap Tastings or to book a tour, go to their website. Paying homage to their marine science backgrounds, Greg Horning and Alex Bergen, owners of Aquatic Brewing in Falmouth, traded their lab coats for beer koozies in 2020 and now run the small batch quality flavor brewery on the edge of downtown Falmouth. Our goal is to make a few beers really well rather than make many different beers in a mediocre fashion, Horning said. Here are their beers, the Aeronax. A New England IPA, the Aeronax is one of aquatic brewing's more popular brews with the standard hazy and juicy New England taste. Defendable Draft. Bergen's current favorite, the Defendable Draft, is an American pale ale with a piney, resinous character with some nice citrusy notes, Bergen said. It's very well balanced. Tawaki. Horning's current favorite, the Tawaki is a pale ale brewed from New Zealand hops. It's a unique kind of tropical forward hop profile that I think is special, he said. Pie in the Sky. Named after Pie in the Sky Bakery and Cafe, this collaboration beer uses roasted coffee from Pie in the Sky to create a coffee oatmeal stout. Beta Bay State. While this collaboration brew with Barnstable Brewing doesn't hit the breweries until mid to late May, the West Coast IPA pays homage to Bergen and Barnstable Brewing brewer Brian Crass's home state. Aquatic Brewing is located on Main Street in Falmouth. For a full list of what's on tap and for their brewery hours, visit their website, aquaticbrewing.com. Bad Martha. With locations in Falmouth and Edgartown on Martha's Vineyard, Bad Martha Beer brings a taste of the Cape and Islands to its beers. Their beers, Mischievous Mermaid. Described by Josh Flanders, general manager of Bad Martha Beer, the Mischievous Mermaid has the same hazy and juicy flavors as a traditional New England IPA, but the Cape Cod sea salt added to the brew makes it a Cape Cod style IPA. Martha's Vineyard Ale. The flagship beer of Bad Martha, the Martha's Vineyard Ale is an English-style pale ale, medium-bodied, according to Flanders, with notes of caramel and toffee. The 508 IPA, the staple IPA of Bad Martha, according to Flanders. The 508 IPA is hoppier and more balanced than a traditional New England-style IPA and has a little more of a malt backbone. Bad, Big Bad Belgian Quad. With an ABV of 10.3%, the Big Bad Belgian Quad is exactly what it sounds like. This is a very rich, complex beer, Flanders said. The beer is made from Belgian candied syrup and has a malt-forward body with hints of plum, according to the website. Bad Martha Beer is located on Upper Main Street in Edgartown and East Falmouth Highway in Falmouth. Knockabout Brewing in Mashpee. 
core to knock about brewing companies' values is having a good time, even their name. A term coined by one of the knockabout co-founder's father means the things you do for fun when you're done doing what you've got to do. So, if you're looking to knock about with a beer in hand, here are a few to try. Beach Hair. Described as their kind of flagship IPA by co-owner Peter Murner, the Beach Hair is a New England IPA with tropical notes from the Citra, Mosaic, and Idaho hops used in the brew, according to their website. Dunes of the Cape. A pina colada milkshake IPA, the Dunes of the Cape might just be your tropical getaway in a glass, as hints of pineapple and coconut shine through the brew. Cape Lager. For Myrner, the Cape Lager is our version of a domestic beer for the folks that like something akin to a Miller, Coors, or Budweiser type product. An easy drinker and crowd pleaser. The Millie Vanilli. Millie Vanilli is a cream soda milkshake IPA, according to Myrner. It almost tastes like cream soda. Knockabout Brewing is located on Lake Avenue in Mashpee, with their second garden party location in Mashpee Commons. And Cape Cod Beer in Hyannis. As the Cape's original microbrewery, Cape Cod Beer knows a thing or two about making a good brew. With a constantly rotating menu, like many other breweries on the Cape, for the sake of this article, we've decided to highlight their six staple beers available year-round on tap and in cans. Beach Blonde. According to brewer Carolyn Brooks, the Beach Blonde is what people think of when they think of Cape Cod beer. The American Blonde Ale is light and refreshing with a hint of toasted malt character, according to their website. Cape Cod Red. Named after the famous Nantucket Reds, this amber ale has hints of toffee with a subtle spicy hop character, according to the website, and is the original beer of Cape Cod beer. Cape Cod IPA. Don't let the name fool you. This West Coast IPA is perfect for those looking for something a little more bitter and more hoppy, according to Brooks, with hints of citrus and malt. Cape Cod Porter. For its year-round dark brew, the porter is a malty brew with flavors of toffee, caramel, and chocolate. Apparently, it's also good on ice cream. Cape Cod Pilsner. Crisp, clean, and with a spicy hop, the website reads, this Pilsner is one of the few lagers brewed by Cape Cod beer. Narrowlands. Finally, their New England IPA. Narrowlands is one of those easy, juicy IPAs, according to Brooks, and tastes, the website says, like grapefruit, guava, mango, and orange rind. Cape Cod beer is on Finney's Lane in Hyannis. Barnstable Brewing in Hyannis. So what does happen when two Jesuits walk into a brewery? The answer, maybe you can find out by trying the beer of the same name at Barnstable Brewing. Their beers are Jesuit Juice. Jesuit Juice is a New England IPA with hints of citrus, like orange, peach, and a touch of floral pine notes, according to Crass. Two Jesuits walk into a brewery. Essentially, it's the double IPA version of Jesuit Juice, according to Crass, with flavors of passion fruit and grapefruit. Cape Crusher. The Cape Crusher is a Hell's Light lager made from water, which imitates that of Munich to kind of lend some more authenticity to it, according to Crass. As for its taste, he says it's a light, bright, crisp, refreshing, easy drinker. Blueberry Ale. Made with Maine blueberries, the Blueberry Ale is Barnstable's fruit beer. With a fruity and floral taste, the beer has a slight twang thanks to its malt backbone, according to the website. Beta Bay State. As mentioned earlier, the Beta Bay State Brew will be hitting taps in May, so keep an eye out for it. Barnstable Brewing is located on West Main Street in Hyannis. We've run out of time today, but be sure to also visit these breweries. Devil's Purse Brewing in South Dennis, Provincetown Brewing Company in Provincetown, and the Offshore Ale Company on Martha's Vineyard. And that's all I have time for today. This is your reader Libby saying thank you for listening.